Hello, hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am thrilled to welcome you. This show is about vision and tactics. We will discover practical techniques to develop your vision of your creativity. We'll also discuss techniques to find the mental and emotional space, as well as the inspiration to create. And then we'll explore what it takes to spread the word about your creation so you can live your best and most creative life. Hello, hello, and welcome to the show. Welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I'm thrilled you're here. I'm also thrilled with my special guests today. Rich Potter is a variety entertainer, comedian, and artist. Full disclosure, he also happens to be my husband. We've been talking about having him on the show for a while now to talk about creativity and its role in the world of clowns, juggling, and fire eating, so I'm super happy to have finally done it. Rich is a graduate of Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus's Clown College. He was in the circus for three years and then spent a number of years traveling the world with his one-man show as a busker. He's recently written and stars in God, the One-Man Show. To me, the show is what would happen if God had severe ADD and he was running late creating the universe. I'll let him tell you all about it. I'm thrilled to welcome Rich Potter to the Creative Mindset Podcast. Rich, welcome. Welcome to the show. Why, thank you. Thanks for having me. (laughs) This is so, it's super fun, but it it is a bit awkward because let's face it, by now we should know each other pretty well, but... Do I know you? (laughs) Well, it's actually tomorrow is 27 years, so I hope by now you know me at least a little. But why don't you tell me a little about your background? What led you to run off with the circus? Uh, well, I was I was uh, minding my own business in ninth grade, and I discovered a friend of mine could juggle. And I had tried, like many kids do, I tried to juggle like I saw the guy on TV or in a show somewhere in the circus. And uh, I was unable to figure it out until this friend in ninth grade showed me that he could. And once I knew he could, I had to know. And so I I learned from him uh, the basics, and then he learned four balls, and I had to learn four balls, and then... Uh, he got a unicycle. I had to get myself a unicycle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by, by 11th grade, I was kind of, uh, going off on my own, um, you know, seeking out opportunities, uh, kind of crashed at the Renaissance festival one year. And then the next year I got a job at the Renaissance festival. Uh, and I just found little opportunities locally, parades and festivals to kind of, uh, do my thing and uh that that led to me auditioning for ringley brothers barnum and bailey clown college um while i was playing hooky from a day of classes at college and uh long story short about six months later i got the phone call and uh the admit admission letter uh filled with uh confetti bomb and uh I ended up in the circus after that. There's so, a lot of ellipses in that description. I'm like trying to edit it out because I know this isn't a four-hour discussion. That's that's great, actually. I, you know, every time you and I are out somewhere and someone finds out that you went to clown college, they want to know all about it. So why don't you, you know, I, I actually haven't heard all about it. So why don't you tell me, what was the experience of training in clown college like? What was that like to train to be a clown? Well, those are two different questions. Um, Clown college is a particular type of training. Training to be a clown could be a variety of other things. Uh, Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Clown College was the only institution of its kind training people specifically for the art form of modern American three-ring circus clown, which is different from stage clown, television movie clown, uh, you know, live theater uh, clown, uh, hospital clown, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's, um, there are many different schools, many different styles, and many different uh, venues in which you would em- employ, you know, the, the art form. Um, but Clown College 
Um, it, it was uh, it was a, an eleven week long program. Uh, it was boot camp, uh, giving us the bare minimum we need in order to start on day one working for the circus if we were granted a contract. And the typical day was uh, we'd spend about a third of the day on circus skills, juggling, unicycling, stilt walking, balancing, rolling globe, roller bola, tight wire, uh, trampoline, acrobatics, et cetera, et cetera. Then another third of the day we'd spend on things like history. We learn classic clown routines, watch videos of vaudeville acts, circus acts uh, from all over Europe and the USA. Another third of the day, uh, we'd be focusing on the artist uh, aspect of it. You know, the circus skills are skills, um, but a clown is an artist. So we're learning things like improv, character development, uh, how to use your body to play to an arena of 20,000 uh, seats. Um, and then another third of the day, we would spend on things like production, uh, building props, making costumes, sculpting noses, uh, working on our makeup. Uh, and in our spare time, we would uh, devise and write routines to present at the end of every week uh, with the hope of it being in the final performance, which was our audition for the circus. And yeah, sometimes we would eat and sleep too. That was like... Five thirds, not 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 three thirds. <laughs> that it sounds like it was incredibly busy, but also productive and inspiring. So tell me, what was the biggest thing you learned at Clown College? What was the thing that blew your mind the most? Uh, um, that's that's a tough question. I I have a hard time. Um, I. I because of the way my mind works, it's always hard for me to say this is my favorite or this is the best. Uh, there were a lot of things I learned. Uh, I mean, part of it was just learning what a clown was. I, I had been putting on makeup and costume and trying to do funny things for about three years before I got to clown college. But I really didn't know what a clown was. And after, after the 11 weeks, I was certain I knew what a clown was. And then it took me another 30 years to realize I really don't know. <laughs> Uh, because every time I, I try to put my finger on a definition of the of what a clown is, I find some other example of something that would fit in that category. Um, and and so it, it's it's really there there are different schools of uh, or I would say different styles of clown. It pops up in cultures all over the world. Uh, you, you find the the one we're most familiar with in the U.S. is European style. That's become American style. Um, there, there's uh, Native American clowns and holy rituals. There's uh, in Japan and China. There, I've, I've experienced uh, there are uh, performing styles which would be analogs to their clowns. Um, and uh, I don't know so much about African or Australian or Native South American, um, but I, I do know that it's just part of the human experience that clowns are. Are, are found pretty much, I mean, where you find humans, you find naturally, we find music, we find uh, performance or storytelling, and an extension of the storytelling is uh, comedy. And if there's always something, usually there's something funny in a story, often they will be acted out. There's, uh, there's like I said, music, there's dance, there's visual art comes out everywhere you go. And clown is just one of those manifestations of uh of human art of human expression so i don't know if i answered your question i i tend to bloviate on the topic <laughs> oh i think it i think you more than answered the question and it it sounds like you like the idea of being a clown of you being a clown and certainly i know this for my own experience of knowing you it it, it inspires you like crazy. So let me ask you, what was the most inspiring part? Was it being a clown as far as being in the circus? Or was there another part of the entire experience that felt like it filled your soul? Uh, well, it was, I mean, for, for, to put this in context, I was 19 years old uh, a year earlier, I graduated from high school. I went to college for a year uh, studying art. And at the end of the year, I was, uh, I was 
out of money, but also wanted adventure. And so I hit the road doing a uh, juggling show around Renaissance fairs around the country, uh, at the end of which is when I got the phone call from Clown College. And um, I was still a very young boy <laughs> at 19 in many ways. Uh, you know, legally we're adults at 18, but we are really, I mean, the difference between a man and a savings bond is bonds mature. Um, but at 19, I, I was still figuring out what the world is. And, and actually, some of my European teachers, they say uh, nobody has any business being a clown until they're 30 years old because until you're 30, you don't really know who you are as a human being and what your purpose is in life or like what, what makes you run and uh, how you interact the world, with the world around you. Of course, it's on a continuum, but it's around 30 that you kind of solidify as a human. And so trying to take a 19-year-old brain and fit it into being a clown, um, I mean, it, it was done. I mean, we, we were able to achieve that in, in the sense of being three-ring American circus-style clowns. Um, but I, I, looking back, it's like I was a scared little boy trying to, you know, be in the, playing in the big leagues. Uh, so, you know, what, what did I learn? Or, or what was the most amazing thing that I learned? Um, I, I think it was just um, how, how to take what I had been doing naturally and uh, put a little polish on it and, and make it like th there's very simple things like when you're on stage, stand still until you have to move. But when you move, make your movement mean something. And I'd never thought anything about that. So that's just one of the basic building blocks that I guess if anyone had uh, you know, an acting class, they learned that too. Uh, I learned it through circus. And um, I guess, uh, what else? Uh, I, one, of, one of my favorite moments at Clown College was one of my improv teachers sat us down in front of a Looney Tunes cartoon and he let us watch it and we all laughed like you're supposed to because they're great art. They're, they're basically, I mean, they, in Clown College, they described uh, one of the definitions of a clown is a live action cartoon. But really, when they started making cartoons and, you know, around the turn of the 19th to 20th, 20th century, cartoon characters, in order to get the movement funny, the animators would study circus clowns and vaudeville clowns and, and dancers. Um, so our teacher took us through this Looney Tunes cartoon, let us watch it, let us enjoy it. And then he rewound it and we, he watched, he took it gag by gag, bit by bit. And he broke down what are the techniques of each gag, like why they work and why are they funny and what the animators were doing which technique they were employing to make this this uh, thing come together. And it was just fascinating. And I learned so much in uh, breaking down that, what, six and a half minute cartoon. Uh, there, there are many other things, but right now, the, the, those are the first, the, those are the main two things that come to mind. Um, I, I guess, yeah, it, it, I got a lot out of improv. Uh, just when you, in, in the clown's world, whatever you, you you encounter an object as a caveman would never having seen a hula hoop for instance or or a space alien coming to earth and encountering this thing for the first time and it's like how would you look at this thing what is it for without knowing what it's for and what it does how do you discover that and and that that's been a really powerful thing under the hood of how i devise how i um how I kind of get into the clown mindset. So in talking about this deconstruction and also the almost first perspective, how did the clown work that you have done inspire you to write about God? <sighs> That's a good question. <laughs> I think 
Well, I, I think I already mentioned the, uh, in a lot of traditional religions, so like non-Judeo Christian religions, you find um, that there's, a, there's a holy man, you know, there's a high priest or a shaman or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And in many of these cultures, either there is a, a clown also taking part in rituals or a trickster character, someone in the tribe who takes on that role of trickster, or sometimes it's the shaman themselves who will, they, they are connecting to the gods, but sometimes they're subverting reality, uh, which is what humor is. It's taking uh, an established thing that everyone understands and turning it on its head. So, um, I, I think there, that aspect just really resonates with me. Um, but as far as like why I wrote this show or, or what was under the hood, I, I, I think back to when, when I was six or seven years old, a little girl down the street my age, um, she's the first one to introduce this idea of God to me. And I was like, well, yeah, she'd been to church and she was just learning it for herself. And she said, um, she asked me if I knew about God. I'm like, no. And so she says, you know, he created everything and, you know, everything in the universe comes from him and he loves us and all this stuff. And I was like, well, okay, that's fine and well, but who created God? And she didn't know. (laughs) You know, we're we're both seven years old. She's trying to make sense of the universe. And so she takes me into her backyard where her uh, her father was, you know, kind of a uh, what was the PC term for this? He was a, a redneck, and he was uh, in the backyard, you know, sawing some wood with a cigarette dangling off his lips, and he had a bunch of crumpled beer cans around his feet. Now, this was the 1970s. Crumpled beer cans they were made of like steel back then, or you know, it it was not these pansy aluminum cans that you can tweak with two fingers. I mean, it took actual strength to, to squeeze these like cast iron uh, beer cans. So the guy, the guy had some heft and he's sawing his wood, red faced in the sun, no shirt on. And she looks up at him and says, dad, who created God? And her dad stops sawing wood for a second, looks up at us just long enough to say, God created himself. And he went back as on his wood. And he did it so definitively and so dismissively that I did not feel comfortable coming up with the follow-up question, which is, are you crazy? <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> but I carried that through, through my, my mind. Every time someone mentions religion and God and, and all this stuff, it, I've always had this trouble understanding the fundamental, like, okay, that's all fine. Well, I love the idea of this, this, this person in the sky that loves us and wants the best things for us. But where did that person come from? Where did that God come from? And no one's ever given me a good, uh, good answer for it. And it, uh, I mean, they, I was, I was just pondering, I've been pondering this for probably 40 years. And one day I was just thinking about it. Well, the beginning of the Bible, like the Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, comma, God. And those four words just resonated so deeply with me. I'm like, wait a minute. So in the beginning, God was already here. What was he doing before he booted up the universe? I mean, he was just in a void. There was nothing. And he was still there always. And so I got the idea to tell that story. What was God doing before he created the universe? It sounds like the seeds of this have been germinating f- since you were a baby, a child. Yep. So, so Very much so. It, it, I, which I think is fabulous. And when you started writing it, did you have notes that you'd been keeping all this time? Can you talk about your writing process for this piece? I can't say I've been keeping notes per se, but I, I can say mental notes. There, there have been things that, you know, have just struck, struck me interesting and fun and funny. And I, 
but part of my journey is you know, I spend a few years in Asia um, traveling around and experiencing, you know, they don't have Judeo Christianity is not as a main religion. They exist. I mean, the, Christianity exists pretty much everywhere in the world, uh, at least a little bit. And, uh, you know, there's even Judaism in China. Uh, China opened itself up during the Holocaust. So a lot of there, there are Jewish communities around, I, I think, Shanghai and uh, a couple of other areas. Um, but uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, bring bring me back to the oh, the writing process. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I, I go off. I go off on tangent. The, the the idea that God has ADD is a little bit autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. <laughs> but uh, so so yeah. I, I, when when I was over in Asia, I was um I, I was like okay, there's you know there's Shintoism and Buddhism and there's uh, you know, I, I never made it to India, but I met a lot of travelers from there. We were talking talking about Hinduism. I did a little research there. And it's like, these are all fabulous stories and, and mythologies. And it goes back to you know, the Greek and Roman heroes and, and gods that inspired the comic books that I loved so much as a kid. So, um, yeah, and all of this is under the hood when I uh, sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write that show. Um, you know, the writing process started with, um, you know, we're going to get, I, I guess, any, any interview with me is going to get to Clown Cabaret, which is another one of my projects. But um, Clown Cabaret uh, is basically a, a forum where um, clowns and variety artists can try out new material. And I made sure that every time we had a show, I would try something new. And that had been going on for about mm, five years or so, six years before I started writing the show. And so I had all these little vignettes, you know, five, ten minutes long. Um, and I, I don't know, probably about three, three or four dozen. And I'm like, okay, well, I want to write this show about God. Let's, let's look through the Rolodex. What, what have I done that is something that could, that God might do. And so out of three dozen, I pared it down to uh, two dozen and then one dozen. And I stripped out a bunch. Uh, and I ended up with like about, I think five, uh, so I have 31 acts that are ready to be made into some other show in the future. <laughs> but uh, right uh, once, once I got these five things that really felt like uh, they, and it was probably more like seven or eight. And as I got writing to stitch them together, I dropped more out. Um, and it, it's, you know, I guess once I had the big chunks, um, you know, I guess the pearls, I just had to fit, find the string to put it on and yeah it, it's there there were a number of ideas that i just i wrote notes and feverishly wrote notes uh for i don't know a, a while um not formally writing the show but it's like i know i want to write the show and this came to mind and once i get an idea in a, in a direction the ideas start flowing, you know, when I'm in the shower, when I'm taking a walk, when I'm driving, you know, all the times so that I'm not trying to think of things, I'm thinking of things. And once I got to a point where I was ready to start writing the show, I had this stack of notes. And um, the, the beginning, the beginning of the show is very easy. It's like in the beginning, God. Okay, so what next? And it's... Um, yeah, how to how to start the show? I, I came up with this uh, just you know in the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth, uh, and the earth was with a form and void, blah blah blah. And then God said, "Let there be," and then I scream from off stage, "Wait, I'm not ready!" And I run on putting my underwear on. Uh, I thought that's a great way to introduce the character of God because uh, you know. <laughs> Catching God with his pants down is something no one would ever imagine. But in this in this universe, in the universe I've created, <laughs> that is perfectly within character. Sure, especially since God is a clown who has ADD. So that's right. that that's a lot of what's going on. So let me ask you, within the the creative vision, because you've talked a good bit about that the process of from when you were six, seven years old and writing furious notes and keeping them going while you're taking a shower or driving. 
What was the most exciting aspect of all of that? You had this creative vision. You wanted to bring it to life. What, what thrilled you about this the most? I think all of it was when, when I started hitting my stride, just imagining an audience receiving what I'm sending. And I just really dig that synergy where like I'm putting it out there and they're, they're digging it and it, it, live. There's nothing like a great live performance. Um, there, there becomes this feedback loop between the audience and the, and the performer. And it's like the, the performer sends the, uh, sends the energy out. The energy comes back from the audience and it fills the performer with more energy and it just the the feedback loop become it, there can be uh, just crackling electricity in the room, um, which is why a lot of performers they try to kind of manufacture it at the beginning. It's like it's why you want to uh, start a show with applause. <laughs> you know, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, presenting blah blah. Everyone, put your hands together, clappity clappity clap. It, it just it builds that energy so that there's there's something to build from. And the audience is a little bit more primed to enjoy the uh, performance. I mean, this this show can happen without it, but everyone it it kind of sets the performer and the audience up for enjoying it more. It's like having um, it's like drinking a fine wine out of a, a beautiful uh, sculpted crystal wine glass versus a, a paper cup. They're they're both the same wine, but it's going to taste just a little bit better out of the the fine crystal. They've done studies on this. And so if there is some energy built up at the beginning of the show, it's going to be, the show is going to be better for the audience and for the performer. So you've done the show a number of times. You've performed it at at fringe festivals and, and in theaters. What has the audience reaction been like? Uh, I'd say unanimously uh, it's been very positive. I've had lots of really great crowds you know, there have been big crowds and small crowds, and one of my crosses to bear uh, for many years after the circus was learning how to perform for uh, a crowd that's only 50 or a crowd that's only 10. And uh, it took me a while to um, stop, like, blaming the audience in my head for them not being 20,000 people. <laughs> uh, and I know it's... Uh, it's a strange thing to, to think about, but it's like, I, I, I was used to that energy. You know, I was one of a hundred people on the floor uh, when I was in the circus, but there was still that crackling energy at Madison square garden where there's like 150 rows all the way around a huge arena. Um, but uh, I, I would say uh, there, there are a couple of crowds that I've had, 14 people and it's it's harder to get a small crowd going um but it was uh they those people got good shows uh i did one show in um at a theater festival that did not promote itself very well and my opening night i had three people (laughs) and the box office manager decided to sit sit down and increase my audience size by 33 (laughs) percent That was a difficult show. <laughs> that audience still liked it, but it, it it's hard to get a, an audience of four people to laugh. It's just, especially if they're like, it's four people sitting alone. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, a, apart from that, it, like I, I, I tend to focus on the negative and it's a, it's a bad thing about my, I mean, um, yeah, I guess, saying that's a bad thing about myself would be focusing on the negative. So I did it twice there. Um, You're an overachiever. <laughs> I'm an overachiever. Thank you. I, <laughs> see, that's why I need you around. You focus on the positive. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, bringing God to life must have its challenges as far as it being God that you've brought to life. Has creating the show challenged any of your beliefs? If so, How? I would say, as far as uh, like spiritual beliefs, uh, I don't think I, it's changed that much. I mean, as I delve into the character of God, 
I, 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 just, I do find it endlessly fascinating just trying to imagine what it would be like to do the things that the God does, God does in the Bible, like what was going through his or her mind. Um, as, as far as uh, it, it's, I, I wouldn't say it, chal- it has challenged my beliefs as an entertainer, but it has caused me to look uh, more deeply into like the clown and the performer and, and uh, the actor. I, I've never really seen myself as an actor, although I've um, written or co-written five shows. Um, but most of the time it's as well, my first couple shows were uh, as a variety artist. So it's like, Hi, here I am. I've got a juggling trick for you. Okay, next trick here. Here's a joke. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, let's go do the thing. And um, doing a theatrical show, it's more, yeah, I'm, I'm still, I, I still say uh, God, the character of God is, is based on me, which is, uh, they say a, a, an actor, an actor kind of portrays a character and a clown portrays themselves. Uh, it's kind of adjustments of your natural tendencies and your your flaws, and you you turn up the volume on certain aspects of yourself to make kind of a caricature of who you are. Um, but uh, as God is kind of this combination of I'm being an actor and I'm being a clown at the same time. Uh, so it's myself. And it's a character, and it's trying to marry those two is uh, it's it's been a challenge. I would say it's been a it's been a good challenge. I've been learning a lot, um, but it's you know, I've had to you know working with a couple of directors, I've had to reassess how I do things and why. And um, it's it's like Michelangelo said, I'm still learning. After 35 years doing this, I'm still learning, and it's it's wonderful. I think it's really wonderful, specifically that it sounds like you've learned things about yourself and your own beliefs about yourself as an entertainer. But this is a show, God the One Man Show, about your idea of what God was doing between let there be and light. So let me ask you this, what, what are your religious beliefs and, and how do you reconcile whatever your beliefs are with this show that you've created? Well, I, I have trouble talking about, uh, or I, not trouble, I, I always worry that me expressing my religious beliefs might turn off uh, one aspect, uh, one group of potential audience members or another. Um, but it, it's, you know, I'll just put it out there. I, I don't feel there is sufficient evidence to warrant a belief in a supreme being, uh, a supernatural being. Um, so, uh, I mean, by that definition, I would be an atheist. However, um, I've had men of God and many believers after my show tell me how much they loved it. So I, I, I've gone through to great lengths to write a show that, um, that is, is open and, and friendly to believers and non-believers alike. I, um, I've tried very hard to adhere to, um, kind of the spirit of the Bible. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I've, I've kind of gone back and forth, uh, with, I've, I've experimented with a handful of religions over the years, um, but I did not grow up with religion, as I it might be apparent from my seven-year-old story. Um, so I, I did not get my brain programmed for religion early, so I don't have that part of my brain um, primed to... to there, there's not a religion-sized hole in my brain. I kind of, when I was experimenting, I had to kind of try to find space for it, and nothing ever seemed to fit. Um, and, and so it, you know, given, given the lack of the early programming, um, I, I just find it easiest to look at the scientific model. And it's like, um, if, if the only evidence you have for 
um, this creator of the universe is in this one book. And there's other books from other regions of the world that tell it happened in a different way. That doesn't reconcile for me. So the easiest thing for me to believe is have no belief. Until and unless you could potentially get proof of one thing or another. Oh, okay. absolutely. But my, my, my mind is absolutely open to um, if, if, if there was sufficient evidence for God, I, I would totally change my beliefs. And however, yeah, I had, a, I had a, a Christian once ask me, what would it take, you know, what, what sign could God send you in order to, for you to believe? And I didn't have a good answer for it. And, and since then, I, I kind of thought about it. And it's like, well, wouldn't an all-powerful being know what it would take to change my mind? <laughs> and I guess the, the question has to be asked, would the all-powerful being care enough to want to change your mind? And that may or may not be the case. Yeah. So, so as, but at, at the same time, within the show, God certainly exists. God is running around creating things throughout the beginning of the show. And then God does some miracles for us. So the show has some variety entertainment aspects to it. How did you combine these arts, the variety arts, with writing a play? What was the process and how did you do it? Well, as I said before, I, I don't see myself as an actor. I see, I see myself as a variety performer. <coughs> so I... I figured uh, rather than pretending to be an actor, I would go uh, lean on my strengths, which are uh, as a variety entertainer. So it, it was just, it was easy for me to go with what I know and put it in a new format and then do, some, I'm, I, yeah, I'm a variety performer, therefore I'm a comedy writer. Um, and so I, I kind of, uh, and I, I figure, God is one of the aspects of God. One of the you know, main selling points is he does miracles. And what, what is it within my repertoire that would constitute a miracle? And it's like, well, how about magic? <laughs> and so I, I kind of uh, took some classic, uh, well, I took a classic magic routine and I re reimagined it uh, through God's eyes. Uh, and it's the classic cups and balls uh, that... Uh, is if if anyone has seen a magician they have probably seen this act and this act uh has very very deep roots in human history in fact if you uh, if you look at the decorations of the paintings on the walls of the egyptian pyramids you will see a magician with two cups and two balls and and a magic wand you know, th this, this act is, as like I said, there are these commonalities of expression for the human experience. And magic has been around as long as mankind. And this cups and balls routine is as old as civilization. And so I thought it was the perfect act to reimagine through God's eyes. Um, so, but I don't want to give too much away because uh, I, I, I want people to experience the show with fresh eyes and not going, Oh, I heard about that on the podcast. So come and see the show and uh, you'll, you'll have a blast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we know there's magic and you're going to leave the rest a mystery. I do a little I... juggling. I'll, I'll put that out there. Juggling <laughs> is, a, a, is also a miracle. And there's, there are a couple more miracles. Uh-huh. So, so the different variety arts are all miracles of different orders. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Well, Let, uh, I, I want to add that one of the purposes of a clown in the circus <clears throat> is um, in, in an atmosphere where the audience is looking up at these people doing amazing superhuman things. They're flying through the air. They're tumbling. They're balancing. This is thing, these are things normal people don't do. And the people down in the circus ring they are superhuman. They're almost like gods. And then this idiotic jackass will walk into the ring and try to do the things and fail. The clown represents the audience because the clown is just like them. The clown can't do the things. And so there, there's something like magical and, and humanizing about the clown connecting the godlike creatures in the circus 
to the human humans in the audience. But I just find that fascinating. It's, uh, yeah. Well, so. and what's really interesting to me about the show, having seen it more than once, is that God is actually quite human and and is funny. Man, and man was made in God's image. There, there you go. So let, let me ask you about that, about the sort of the religious aspects of the show and it being a comedy. It's about God and it's a comedy. How do you think someone who's religious, deeply religious, might feel about the show? Well, uh, <laughs> I guess the short answer is I know I can't please everybody. Um, however, I, I, like I said, I, I went through great lengths to, uh, to write a show that is accessible to believers and non-believers alike. And I... I I, I feel bad that there are some people who won't be able to enjoy it. Um, but I would imagine like uh, the Westboro Baptist church people, they can probably stay away. I, actually, I wouldn't mind them showing up and picketing because they would probably get, generate some publicity for me. <laughs> but uh, I don't think they would come inside to watch. And I don't, if they did, I don't think they would enjoy it very much. But they're like, I've had a, I guess the first man of God to come up to me after the show was a, a conservative rabbi. He shook my hand and said he really loved it. Uh, later on, a pastor uh, a pastor came up to me. He was a pastor for 30 years. He said, I, was, I, I loved it. It was very funny. It was warm. It was thoughtful. And it was like, okay, thank, thank you. And uh, an, another, uh, another person who came to, uh, to my show is a, a friend of mine who's Muslim. And he loved it. And, um, you know, when I try to... Uh, kind of explain to people like the sensibility and that it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, a, a pastor, a rabbi and a Muslim. And then they stop me and say, I've heard this joke. <laughs> <laughs> so you've mentioned that adults can really get something out of it and will enjoy it. What about children? What age range do you think is appropriate to appreciate the show fully? Well, I, I mean, the, the shorthand when, like, when I'm trying to tell people ab about the show, you know, I, and when I say tell them, if, um, this, this is like in the context of a theater festival where the festival brings people in, but it's up to the artists to generate the, you know, talk to people one on one at the beer tent and say, hey, you know, this show's great, come see it, and you have to give the the elevator pitch in 30 seconds, and the, you know, what, the shorthand is PG-13. Uh, now I I have friends who have brought their kids uh, as, as young as nine. The nine-year-old loved the show. In fact, the nine-year-old heckled me. <laughs> and I had, to hand, I had to dig deep into my, uh, my bag of uh, street performer tricks and, and handle this kid who was heckling me. And it, like his, his father, my friend, <laughs> former friend, uh, he, he, <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my friend, uh, he was sitting in the front row, his nine-year-old was blabbing at me and I look at him, and he's just beaming. He's just smiling. He's like, ah, I got rich now. <laughs> and so uh, I, I think I handled it very well. Um, yeah, I, I had this, I keep a Rubik's Cube on stage with me just in case. If there's some sort of uh, emergency, if I lose my place, if I need to change the energy, I have a Rubik's Cube. I figure that's, that's something God might have been doing for the eons before he created the universe. Um, so it's within character. And so the kid heckles me and I fire back a couple of retorts, you know, uh, I'm, I'm kid. I, I'm going to put this in my plan. I'm going to make some animals eat their young and you're why. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Yuck. <laughs> uh, but then, then he, he actually, he threw me. I, I lost my place. I forgot where I was in the show. So I, I pull out the Rubik's Cube and I start fiddling with it, hoping I can like reboot my system. And I, I have, like I can do the Rubik's Cube. I can, I can solve it as a subroutine while I'm thinking of other things. So, so I, I start going about that process and I'm like, you know what? Uh, I, I, can, I can solve the Rubik's Cube while I'm trying to find my place, but there needs to be some addressing of the audience too. And that, that was too many things to do at once. And I said, you know what, kid? Screw it. You solve it. And I threw it to him. <laughs> and then there's a long, quiet pause. Uh, well, there's, there's a big laugh. Then there's a long, quiet pause. And then from the darkness, the entire audience hears, 
click, 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> and they bust up again it was like the best thing that could have happened <laughs> that was a moment of inspiration i love it i love it and, that's fabulous and I, the, the kid unfortunately he returned it to me after the show because i really uh and he only had one side solved <laughs> and i really wish he had returned it to me during the show just so i could have shown him up <laughs> I'm kind of glad that that didn't happen. That that would have uh, been. I'm not sure the critics would have loved that. <laughs> okay. How many children has God gotten uh, has gotten the better of? Come on. Oh my goodness. So yeah. Well, and if you if you'd have had other people on stage with you, if this weren't a one man show, then you losing your place might not have been so bad, right? You could have had somebody else on stage with you, like you do with Clown Cabaret, right? You when you do a lot of the stuff, you do it with your colleagues. And how is that? How is it different versus similar to creating your own play and working it solo? Well, I at the roots of my career, uh, I I've always been a soloist, and um, you know, I, I guess one of the things I learned at Clown College was actually how to work with partner. Um, but once I left the circus, I, I, I was a soloist again for another fifteen years or so before. Um, uh, <laughs> wait, 25 years. Oops, <laughs> I'm losing time. Um, yeah, so I, I left the circus and um, I was a soloist up until Clown Cabaret. And um, I, I still have the skills. Uh, I, I worked in, a, in the hospital with a partner quite a bit um, as, as a hospital clown. Um, so I, I, I got a lot of chops working with people and a lot of experience uh, working with different partners. So um, when I, I got to Clown Cabaret, it was just like, oh, well, I'm, I'm working with this massive, it, it's three of us who founded it, and I'm working with this one massively talented person and this other massively talented person, and I think I'm okay, and, you know, we should do something together. You know, we're doing these monthly shows, and we're not doing anything together. And so I, we kind of wrangled together, and one of our um, founders, he was in the process of getting a master's degree in classical acting which meant Shakespeare and um, I said hey there's a great premise you, you you're in, you got your feet in the clown world and you're trying to step up and you know be a not step up step to a different arena and do Shakespeare and why don't you endeavor to do that um, and the other two of us will help you <laughs> Quote, unquote, help yes. you. you. You heard my italics. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I guess I should name, name and shame them. Uh, Matthew Polly and Karen Barris. Uh, and so Matthew Polly was uh, going, um, going, getting his uh, degree, and Karen and I were uh, the helpers. And we tried very hard in our, our ineptitude to make sure he was a great success, and we... Um, he ends up killing us. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and that show was it, Delusions of Grandeur, correct? Well, yeah. Eventually, that it expanded into Delusions of Grandeur. Um, but uh, and then you know one of the uh, one of the vignettes we put into Delusions that we it was like three gangsters who are doing the heist of a, the century. It was a piggy bank, and. We, we never felt that it fit in that show, but we needed those 10 minutes to make it a, a full show. And eventually we we're like, no, nope, we're going to yank it out. And we turned that into another show called The Heist. And we expanded that into uh, like that. That was a silent comedy. That was uh, that was a really amazing experience. We did. It's like it's an hour long show with three gangsters uh, doing comedy without any words. Um. But to to get get the long way around to answering your question, uh, it's it's a very different thing working with partners versus myself. And one of the things, one of the uh, things, I wouldn't say it's a main thing, but um, if I lose my place and I'm on stage, I have to catch myself. If I'm on stage with two other people and I lose my place, or I mess something up, I've got people with they have my back and I have theirs. And it's it's a different dynamic. It's like I'm. It's very comforting to work with other people, and it wasn't when I started, but it became comforting. And because I'm so used to being a soloist, 
um, it was at the beginning, it was kind of, I was a little bit anxious. It's like, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to be here with this other person and, you know, not hog the stage because that's, that's what a soloist has to do. <laughs> and it's like, okay, now I, I, am I hogging the stage? Am I giving enough? Am, is the audience interested in me and them? And uh, are we doing the synergy right? But um, it, it's really comforting to have each other's backs and we created some wonderful things together that I would never have been able to do on my own. It sounds like it inspired you a lot to work with them and through working in Clown Cabaret certainly inspired God the One Man Show. Sure. Are you doing anything that inspires you right now? What What's most inspiring to you right now as an artist? Because I know, for example, you're an amazing illustrator and a painter. And of course, you're a variety entertainer. So there are always things that you could be doing. But what's most inspiring to you right now? Well, well right now I'm preparing, <clears throat> preparing for another uh, uh, performance of God. And so that's kind of taking up, uh, taking up my the space in my brain that would be the creative side. Now I'm still creating in that I'm, I'm rehearsing and I'm as, as I go through the script again and again, these little tweaks happen and I'm fine new wordings and, you know, new jokes to put in. But, um, yeah, I, I guess the, the main thing, I think through much of my artistic career, the main thing that, that inspires me is knowing that it's, uh, whatever it is, is going to be seen by an audience. <laughs> and then what, whatever, whatever uh, path I need to take to get to that audience happens. Uh, I've never, I've never uh, been in front of an audience without something to do. Because <laughs> I, I, I know a, it, the show must go on. Um, and as far as visual art, though, um, you know, and, oh, and also I want to say in, in my live performances, I, I try to stay away from politics. It's like everyone's already talking about it and thinking about it and arguing about it and hating each other over it. It's, it's like, I, I, that's not what I want to bring to the table. I, I you know, I, I want to bring people out of their houses to think about something other than that, that sort of stuff. However, my visual art, um, I, I do find myself making some, some commentary on um, politics, uh, but also, you know, pop culture. Uh, I, I do, yeah, I, I, most of my visual art has a comic bent to it, um, looking at the world through new eyes. And it really, I, um, I, 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 can't, I can't say what's inspiring like uh, overarchingly what, what inspires me is just, I, uh, I set my pencil or pen down and, uh, it starts moving and then ideas come, you know, sometimes I'll be going through my life and pick something out of, uh, out of what's happening in front of me or my mind is wandering. And you know, that, uh, I, I, I feel lucky in that if I let my mind go, the ideas are right there. But I, I also believe everyone, else has that same ability i just have exercised that muscle for most of my life so i know how to work that muscle um but it i i i've written about this in the past how the the human brain is creative it is designed or evolved to be creative which is how we have things like stone tools and hammers and uh, wheels and, you know, moving our way up through technology. Uh, it's like you, you need, uh, you need to ba bash in a tent stake when you're camping and uh, you, you left your mallet at home. Well, you don't say, wow, I can't, I can't hammer in the tent stake. You look for a rock. You know, that's, that's human ingenuity. It's like, I, I have this job to do. What can I do that job with that I have access to? Um, so that, that's the foundation of creativity. Uh, and that's technological creativity or solving a problem. Art is all solving problems. Um, and, and so, you know, putting two pieces of wood together with a nail, 
or you don't have a nail, you have a screw. Uh, you, you paint it. Well, why did you choose that color? So what you had in garage, in your garage? Okay, well, you chose to paint it or you chose not to paint it. Um, maybe uh, you paint your hand and then you put a handprint on it. Uh, you know, tracing your finger through the sand or your toe through the sand at the beach. Uh, it, it, I, I think, uh, yeah, it, we, we all have the ability to be creative. Where do we find our inspiration? You know, it's, I guess it's different for everyone and it's the same for everyone. It's locked inside the human brain and we just have to like find the, the channels to get into it. Um, and yeah, I, I'm very much inspired at the fundamentals from by uh, my, my gods were Steve Martin, uh, Gary Larson of the far side and uh, you know, Bill Irwin, who very few people know, but he's an amazing clown who has had multiple Broadway runs with one man shows or a couple man shows. Um, and so, yeah, it, I, I could go on about my heroes. Those, those were like three very, powerful uh, fundamental ones early in my uh development and, and for yeah for Go those of, yeah for those of us who need a little bit of i guess help i would say because i agree with you we are all fundamentally creative but many of us might not know where to start so if we needed some resources about the variety arts about painting drawing do you have anything that you could recommend books or websites resources people could go to find out about some of these things yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, I mean, for for clowns, I would say uh, go see go see circuses. Come to Clown Cabaret. <laughs> um, Just so you know, Clown Cabaret is in Washington D.C. So if you happen to be listening to this and you are in Salem, Oregon, you might have to wait <laughs> until Clown Cabaret takes its show on the road. Right. Um, th thank you. Yes. I, um, so yeah, I, I would say, uh, th there are th in, in Oregon, I, I know Portland has a clown scene. Uh, San Francisco has a huge clown scene, New York, uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, Los Angeles. There are a few pockets in Texas, uh, you, Chicago. Um, there, there's where you find the arts, you're going to find more of a hub of clowns. Um, and, uh, so yeah, seeing, seeing us live is the best. Uh, now when I say clown, uh, I'm talking about theatrical and circus clown. Uh, you might see a decent clown at, a uh, maybe a state fair or a county fair, but also you might see someone who's dressed in clown makeup with a wig and they're twisting balloons. Um, and yeah, that's I, another variety art, right? So that might not be, that might not be clowns specifically, even though they're wearing uh, the mask of a clown, but they may be a variety entertainer, like a balloon twister or, or some other type of variety artist. Is that true? Right. It, exactly. It's it's just like if they wear a doctor coat and they're standing there twisting balloons, it doesn't make them a doctor, <clears throat> but the balloon art is art. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel very strongly <laughs> that um, that when when you see uh, someone dressed as a clown who's uh, just painting faces or just twisting balloons, it communicates to the public that that is the role of a clown. And I, I've had many kids who one of the reasons I stopped wearing makeup when I work outdoor festivals is because when I wore the makeup, kids would approach me and say, "Do you have a balloon for me?" And I know <laughs> that's not what I do. Hey, let's here. Let me show you a trick. You, hey, help me do this, you, this thing. Um, let's have some fun. It's like, no, I want a thing. And well, I don't have a thing for you. And then they, they're <laughs> sometimes they stick around for the fun. And sometimes they, they were just sent over by their parents to get, get a thing from me. It's like, well, their parents are teaching them the wrong thing. Um, so, but yeah, when, when I'm, when I'm talking about the art form of clown, I'm talking about like a, basically a visual storyteller, someone who's on stage. And the story they're telling is not 
you know, once upon a time. The, the story they're telling is happening here in front of you and it's unfolding for the, the performer and the audience together. So it's like, you're, it, the, the story is here and now. Okay. So it sounds like the resources themselves would be... The e- resources. <laughs> right. They're, okay. They're intrinsic. <laughs> okay. I, I got bloviating. bloviating again. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So as far as like uh, library resources, uh, one of the, the best books out there is uh, Clowns by John Towson, T-O-W-S-E-N. Um, he wrote this as a PhD thesis back in 1977, and it's been read by clowns all over the world. It's, it talks about the history of clown and kind of uh, go, going back to uh, re- really, oh, it mentions the clowns that were depicted on the inside uh, walls of Egyptian pyramids. So w- once again, when I say uh, as old as human civilization, uh, just like the cups and balls, clowns were there too. And I'm sure before the Egyptian pyramids, before we re- were recording these sorts of things, I'm sure the Sumerians and the Babylonians, et cetera, et cetera, they were doing the same thing. That They had someone who, who uh, was in that role. But anyway, Clowns by John Towson, there's a book called Durov's Pig, uh, which is about a uh, 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 Russian clown uh, who did... Uh, kind of during the time of the Russian Revolution, he was uh, kind of a big uh, big deal circus clown, made some social commentary and political commentary through his clown, um, D-U-R-O-V, Durov's Pig. Um, I learned a lot from the juggling book by Carlo. I don't even know if it's still in print, but it was very useful to me in the early 1980s, juggling for the complete klutz. And uh, it's another book, uh, oh, I... The Complete Juggler, I think, by Dave Finnegan. Uh, the Complete Klutz thing was, I believe that was also Dave Finnegan. I'm going back uh, in my memory banks. Uh, I learned I learned uh, a lot of my magic I learned from Gazzo, um, G-A-Z-Z-O. Uh, Gazzo, he's uh, world-renowned in the uh, magic community. He's a master of cups and balls. Um, I learned cups and balls from him. Uh, he also does uh, a video on uh, the black bag, the, the magical black bag. Uh, it produces an egg um, in a class. It's another classic routine, but he <coughs> he teaches that very well. <clears throat> um, pardon me. <coughs> I've been talking a while. Um, mime, sp- mime Spoken Here is a book by Tony Montanaro. Uh, he was one of my teachers. He taught mime for many, many years. He founded the Celebration Barn, which is a school I went to up in uh, South Paris, Maine. Um, he sadly passed away about 10 years ago by uh, some annoying cancer thing. Um, and also, uh, I find uh, what, watching... Yeah, I, I watch Looney Tunes because I love them, but also I find them just inspirational. They help me feel out timing and you know, kind of structure and uh, just it, those, those are good things to kind of get a feel for physical comedy. When, when you look at it through a clown's eyes, um, those are very invaluable, as well as just watching the masters, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Dick Van Dyke, Lucille Ball. Um, Sid Caesar and Carl Reiner in your show of shows. Uh, Ernie Kovacs, he's, I think he's underrated. He's kind of, a lot of people don't remember him, but he was one of the greats in the 1950s. Uh, he invented a lot of things about television when television was new, as Ernie uh, K-O-V-A-K-S. Um, Laurel and Hardy, you know, Abbott and Costello, uh, even... even like watching John Belushi and uh, Jim Carrey, Steve Martin, uh, Robin, Robin Williams as well. And, you know, he he is, was more of a quick-witted verbal comedian, but he had a lot of clown-like uh, aspects to what he did. So, yeah, watching, watching people do it, 
uh, and do it well, you can learn a lot. Oh, Bill Irwin, a re the regard of flight. Um, you know, that's that was the first thing I saw. Man, he's done uh, old hats with David Shiner. The, I think that's on video now. Uh, and Fool Moon, F O O L Moon. Um, just some of the things I've watched over the years that have really struck a chord and um, inspired me to do, to be better, uh, do better, make better comedy. Uh, so yeah, uh, a few, those are a few books, uh, some videos and, uh, yeah, some masters to look up to get a feel for physical comedy. Terrific. That's a, that's a great set of resources and I am going to put them all in the show notes so that if you want to find these, find, the videos, find links to them, find links to the books, you'll be able to do that. But Rich, let me ask you about you specifically. Where can people find you? What are your social media handles? Where is Rich Potter in the internet? For the show uh, specifically, there's God, the one man show.com. Uh, Facebook is uh, facebook.com slash God, the one man show. But a wider breadth of like how you can find more of me and you can find some of my visual art and um, some of my other projects um, on richpotter.com. It's probably the easiest way to launch out to find other things. Uh, on Instagram, awful cute is where I post a lot of my art as it happens, like visual art as it happens. I don't do a lot of... I, I don't do performance video there, but if you you want to see what sort of visual images come out of the disturbed mind that is, that is mine, <laughs> um, that's a place to go. Um, the, that's awful cute. Um, and on Twitter, I not really on Twitter much, but uh, Rich is nice <laughs> is the, my Twitter handle. Uh, but again, again richpotter.com is probably the easiest way to find any of those things. And uh, you click on the about and there's a list of stuff. And Terrific. I'll, I'll, I'll send all that to you so you can just put it in your show notes. Ah, that sounds great. I appreciate that. Well, talking about show notes, where is, I know you said that you're preparing to put the show up again, God, the one man show. Where is it going to go up next? Where are you going to be performing it next? And more importantly, how can people get tickets or learn more about it? I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so I am going to be doing a, a one-off performance of it uh, on March 23rd in Silver Spring, Maryland, the Hillendale portion of Silver Spring for the locals that might mean something. And you can find out about tickets for that at God, the one man show.com. Um, and uh, the next stop for God is, July, I will be at the Winnipeg Fringe Festival. That's up in, uh, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's Alberta. I'm a terrible neighbor to Canada. I, I, I don't know which province Winnipeg is in. Um, I know, I'm sure they know all our states and we could probably, I could probably name three of their provinces. Um, but yeah, Winnipeg Fringe Festival in July. And uh, I, I, in talks with, uh, theater in Pennsylvania, but I'm not quite sure. If, like, there's no news there, but I'm um, talking there, and a couple of other theaters I've pinged. But uh, it's a long and drawn out process to get on a, a theater's calendar, and so uh, there's those. Those are the main two things to announce at this point in time. And I'm sure you're going to update on RichPotter.com and also on GodTheOneManShow.com as soon as you have news on that. Is that true? Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I, we're, we're down to the last thing that I wanted to talk about. And that is, tomorrow is 27 years that we've been dating. Do I know you? <laughs> actually, that wasn't the last thing I wanted to talk about. I actually, <laughs> <laughs> but I just went, really, that's, I'm amazed. We keep saying this to each other too. More than half our lives, more than half our lives, 27 years dating. That's amazing. But seriously, I did want to, I, I did want to ask you, we've talked a lot about art, the art of clown, the art of, of, of variety, entertainment, fine art, all of these different things. 
within all of this stuff in your brain, do you have any last thoughts that you want to share? Uh, that's, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've deluged everything uh, out of my head and uh, I'm completely empty. There's nothing else I have to say about anything. <laughs> Well, okay, good. So bring something good for dinner and uh, yeah. everything will be fine. No, you know, and it's because it, it's funny to me when whenever I spend time talking to an artist, every single person who is creative and everyone is creative as far as I'm concerned, we all have a different perspective on what it means to be an artist, to be creative. And in fact, if we start talking about the definition of art, There will be, you know, if there are five people talking about it, there'll be at least eight opinions. So it seems to me like the best thing we can do for art is to keep making it, to keep creating it, to do it every day, to explore what it means to have art in our lives and more importantly, to make it and to share it. So Rich, I really want to thank you so very much for taking the time to talk about your art and your craft and your entertainer habits and especially God the One Man Show here on the Creative Mindset Podcast. It was fascinating. I learned some things about you even after 27 years that (laughs) I had not known. So I thank you so much for joining me. I wish you all the best. Break a leg on March 23rd and also up in Winnipeg in Canada this summer. Everyone, I want you to go find out about God the One Man Show. And if you have a theater in your area that you think that this show would rock, please get in touch with Rich Potter and find him and get that show out on the road because, frankly, he's around too much and I need a little break. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but seriously, uh, if, you, if you have a theater in mind, if you say to yourself, hey, you know what? that would be great in my church or we have a a town theater that would be really great in our town theater. Or if you have a fringe festival in your city and you want to see God, the one man show perform there, please get in touch with Rich Potter. And and you have a couch for me to stay on. (laughs) That's why they invented couchsurfing.net, right? So yeah, absolutely. And in the meantime, if you are enjoying this podcast and this exploration of how to be a creative and how to work with creatives, please let me know comment below with any questions and definitely please review the show on itunes or on google Podcasts. let me know what you're thinking i'd love to know and until next time when i'm going to be thrilled to bring you more information about your creative mindset this is isolde trachtenberg and i send you all of my love Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and please tell your friends about the community we're building here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright Isolde Trachtenberg 2019. Today's music was from Kevin McLeod, Laser Groove, and Avi Marimba, brought to you by Creative Commons License 3.0. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, I send you all all of my love.